In our headlines on this Friday afternoon, May 31st, here in South Korea. U.S. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Bidon Patel on Thursday said the U.S. has no intention of redeploying its tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula following prospects of such possibility at the U.S. Senate. Meanwhile, South Korea is scheduled to host its largest summit with Africa as 48 nations from the continent, including 25 heads of government, travel to the peninsula to talk trade, sustainability and broader solidarity. And on the local economic front, industrial output rebounds on month in April, bolstered by production in the auto industry, but retail sales and facility investment surrender ground. U.S. foreign affairs officials have dismissed talk of deploying tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea. Remarks to this end follow a related warning from Russia amid a U.S. Senate report about prospects of replacing such weapons on the Korean Peninsula. Our Lee Seung Jae reports. Amid nuclear threats posed by North Korea, a ranking member of the U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee on Wednesday raised the idea of deploying U.S. tactical nuclear weapons to South Korea to increase deterrence against the regime. To this, Republican Senator Roger Wicker proposed a redeployment of U.S. tactical nuclear weapons on the Korean Peninsula. However, according to U.S. State Department Deputy Spokesperson Bidan Patel on Thursday, the U.S. has no plans to redeploy its tactical nuclear arms on the Korean Peninsula. He emphasized that the U.S. does not see returning nuclear weapons to the Indo-Pacific as necessary. The comments also come as Wicker's proposal was met with a heavy pushback from Moscow. In a recent interview, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov warned that Moscow may consider additional nuclear deterrent steps if the U.S. deploys IRBMs in the Indo-Pacific region. But the U.S. State Department's spokesperson said Lavrov's comments was Russia engaging in nuclear saber rattling. Patel also condemned North Korea's ballistic missile launches on Thursday and noted Beijing's role in helping address the security challenge from Pyongyang. He also commented on the North's sending of balloons carrying trash and fecal matter to the South earlier this week, calling the move malign and destabilizing. U.S. tactical nuclear weapons were withdrawn in South Korea in 1991, and the country has since stuck to its non-nuclear status, relying on the U.S.'s security commitment. Lee Seung Jae, Arirang News. And here in Korea, President Yoon Seo-gyeol is playing host to his counterpart from Sierra Leone, Julius Mada Bio, on this Friday. The two heads of government held a group discussion and saw the penning of an MOU before a luncheon at the Yongsan presidential office. South Korea and Sierra Leone established diplomatic relations in the year 1962 and shared a trade volume worth over 23 million U.S. dollars in 2022, with South Korea importing fish and metal materials. Sierra Leone is one of four African countries invited to South Korea for an official visit ahead of the Korea-Africa summit next week with 48 nations from the continent. And the official Korea-Africa summit is scheduled for next Tuesday, June 4th. And for more on the broad agenda ahead, here's our top office correspondent, Kim do -yeon. 48 African nations, among those around 30 heads of state. That's the expected size of the first Korea-Africa summit hosted by South Korea on June 4th and 5th. The summit's theme is the future we make together. Making this the grand basis of Korea-Africa cooperation, we will deeply discuss the three goals, shared growth, sustainability, and solidarity. According to the top office on Thursday, the first event-wide engagement will be the dinner banquet on June 3rd. And after the main opening ceremony kicks things off, the leaders will go into discussions. And after the closing ceremony, there will be a joint press conference by President Yoon and African Union Chair and Mauritania's President Mohamed Oud Gwazwani. On the 5th, South Korea's Trade Ministry and Korea's Trade Investment Promotion Agency, or COTRA, will host a business summit. During this period, there will also be 13 sideline events. South Korea had actually been eyeing this event for a long time, first announcing the plan back in 2022. 
더욱 체계적으로 추진하기 위해 아프리카와의 기존 장관급 포럼을 정상급으로 격상하겠습니다. 이를 위해 2024년 한국에서 한아프리카 특별정상회의를 개최하고자 합니다. The top office emphasized that 60% of the African population is under the age of 25, with a big market and abundant key natural resources, saying it's a must that South Korea enhances exchanges with the continent, adding such a summit has come late. Considering our country's status in the international community, it seems somewhat late to hold the first summit now. However, the fact that most invited countries have expressed their intention to attend reflects Africa's high expectations for cooperation with South Korea. The top office named three key aims. First, strengthening economic cooperation for co-growth, focusing on sharing South Korea's export expansion experiences. Second, promoting the transformation of industrial and digital infrastructure, focusing on the agro and fishery industries with expanded aid. Lastly, tackling global challenges together, especially through agricultural technology transfer projects. In the meantime, an official says, while this is only the first event, so it can't be said for sure, and hosting around 50 nations is no easy task, it'll be the best to make it a regular event every four to five years, so administrations that follow can host such a summit at least once. Kim do Arirang News. Meanwhile, Korea's southern resort island of Jeju is hosting its annual forum on peace, with participants this year calling for greater effort by middle powers to ease geopolitical tensions. Our foreign affairs correspondent Pei Yunji has more. An annual peace forum officially kicked off on Thursday on South Korea's southern island of Jeju. One of the key events, the World Leader Session, was held after being suspended for four years because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Former and current heads of international organizations have gathered here on Jeju Island to address geopolitical uncertainties as the world faces multiple crises, including ongoing conflict in Ukraine and the Middle East. Taking part in this series event was former United Nations Secretary General Pan Ki-moon and former Japanese Prime Minister Yasuo Fukuda. Pan stressed the need for South Korea to work closely with the United States and other like-minded countries to find ways to monitor North Korea. Noting that the North has been neglecting UN Security Council resolutions, he expressed concerns about the regime's military cooperation with Russia. We must continue to press the members of the Security Council to extend, uh, to revive the panel of experts on monitoring North Korean uh, nuclear uh, issues. It's a shameful that uh, Russia has been supporting continuously until they, they received some uh, military materials uh, to attack the Ukraine. In March, Russia blocked the annual renewal of a United Nations panel tasked with overseeing international sanctions against North Korea using its veto power. The move was strongly criticized by Ukraine, the U.S., France, the U.K. and other Western countries and prompted South Korea and its allies to seek alternatives to keep an eye on the North. Meanwhile, the executive director of the APEC Secretariat, who also took part in the event on Thursday, stressed the importance of middle powers in order to overcome global risks, referring to countries that sit below great powers but still have influence over global politics. I really feel that there is a role for middle powers in helping us to deal with those issues, whether it's climate change, whether it is uh, the digital issues, whether it's AI, whether it's the energy transition. There are more than 300 experts taking part in this year's Jeju Forum. It will run until Friday at the Jeju International Convention Center. Peunji, Arirang News, Jeju. Korea's industrial output rebounded on month in April, but retail sales and facility investments surrendered ground. Our correspondent Moon Hedion covers the latest market activity. 
South Korea's overall industrial production saw a rise in April this year on the back of a boom in auto production, although spending and investments saw a decline. According to Statistics Korea on Friday, industrial production in April rose by 1.1 percent compared to the previous month. This is a result of increased production in mining, construction and services, with the rebound following an on-month downturn in March when a 2.3 percent decrease was recorded, the sharpest drop in nearly four years. There was also a significant rise in output from the auto industry which contributed to the increase, tallying up to a rise of 8.1 percent on month, which is the largest hike recorded since January last year. Production in the mining industry decreased for semiconductors, but production for automobiles and chemical products increased by 2.2 percent compared to the previous month. Semiconductor production showed a decline of more than 4 percent compared to March, logging two straight months of on-month decline. However, the agency explained that this was due to the base effect with the country's chip industry showing robust recovery at the start of the year and pointed out that compared to the same month last year, it rose by more than 20 percent. A spokesperson from Statistics Korea said that although production has generally performed well, consumption of the produced goods has been unable to keep up. Retail sales, a key measure of private spending, showed a 1.2 percent drop on month, while sales of non-durable goods such as cosmetics and semi-durable goods such as clothes rose. Sales of durable goods such as cars fell. Facility investment also saw a downswing of 0.2 percent due to a slowdown in the machinery sector. Moon Hyeon, Arirang News. Seoul's Education Ministry early Thursday announced its admissions guidelines for the academic year of 2025. Doctors in response took to the streets late Thursday in protest of the expanded medical school quarter. Our Park Onu reports. An estimated of 5,000 doctors gathered in front of Toksugung Palace in Seoul on Thursday night for a candlelight rally against admissions quota hike for medical schools in South Korea next year. Under the slogan of a death sentence for the Korea medical system, the Korea Medical Association also held rallies in five other parts of the country, including Busan, Daegu, and Daejeon. Lee myung tae the head of the KMA, strongly criticized the government for making decisions unilaterally instead of discussing them with doctors. During the protest, he also hinted at an even bigger fight they would carry out in June. He asked for senior doctors, including practitioners, to join the fight, together with the junior doctors, students, and professors. Contrary to speculations, Im didn't announce a general walkout during the protest. While the medical community strongly criticized the government for ordering doctors to return to work, some doctors appealed to the government to open official lines of communication and persuade them to come back. On Friday as scheduled, medical schools are expected to release the details of their 2025 admission guidelines reflecting the fixed quota announced by the Education Ministry the day before. According to the ministry, there will be a total increase of 1,497 students entering medical schools compared to the year before across 39 colleges nationwide. That adds up to a total of 4,610 medical school places for 2025. Park Onu, Arirang News. Korea's 22nd National Assembly entered office on Thursday amid much anticipation for a fierce tug of war over a contentious bill that failed to pass the previous assembly. Here's our political correspondent, Yi shi -hu. The 22nd National Assembly kicked off on Thursday with a fresh makeup of lawmakers. The ruling People Power Party began a two-day workshop in the city of Cheonan in Chungcheongnam-do province, away from the National Assembly in the capital. President Yoon Song yeol visited to show support and encourage conservative lawmakers to work for the people of South Korea. The PPP floor leader Chu Gyeong-ho said the workshop's main goal is to strengthen solidarity. Chu has had the weight lifted off his shoulders after successfully keeping his PPP representatives from deviating away from the party's stance during the recent parliamentary vote on a contentious bill that aimed to prompt a special investigation into the death of a Marine last year. On Thursday, Chu told the party that they must unite as one to prevent what he described as a flood of legislation from the opposition in the new assembly. 
Meanwhile, the main opposition Democratic Party, which pushed for the special investigation bill with support from minor parties, both conservative and liberal, initiated its next legislative move. On Thursday, it proposed a modified version of the original bill. The new bill expands the scope of the investigation and allows for greater input from minor opposition parties in the probe team formation process. The party chairman Lee Jae-myung said the DP, together with the people, will ensure the legislation goes through. The party also introduced what it calls a number one livelihood bill, which, if enacted, would provide vouchers worth around 250,000 Korean won, or 180 U.S. dollars, to all citizens of South Korea. They say the vouchers to be used at local businesses will boost spending and revive the economy. The 22nd National Assembly retains the previous parliament's small ruling and large opposition status, consisting of 108 PPP and 171 DP lawmakers. A total of 192 seats are taken up by the pan opposition across parties. Lee si hoo Arirang News. In other news, classrooms of the future here in Korea will seek more interactive learning experiences, taking full advantage of advances in technology. Our Che Seung offers us a glimpse. The teacher rolls digital dice instead of using chalk. Students use tablet styluses instead of pencils. This is a model classroom showing education methods for future generations at the 2024 Korea Global Education Fair in Yosu, Jeollanam-do province. The teacher running the model AI classroom said it is time to prepare for future education that goes beyond the accumulation of knowledge. When we teach, we prioritize problem-solving skills over mere knowledge memorization. We focus more on this area by creating problem-solving spaces in the metaverse, which brings many positive effects. Pong, the teacher said that future education will be based on sharing and communication, unlike traditional passive education where knowledge is simply delivered from a teacher to the student. Students who participated in a history class said they could focus even more and enjoyed learning interactively. It's definitely more interesting and fun to learn within games on a screen compared to just reading textbooks. Communicating with the teacher is also more efficient. Instead of just listening to the teacher's lecture from a textbook, we can present together and see the teacher from different angles, making the class more effective. One of the educational devices company officials participating in the fair spoke about the schools that apply future education systems. In one middle school and one high school, the system is now in place and working effectively. According to school officials and teachers, using our system has notably reduced fatigue during full-day classes and significantly improved efficiency in sharing lessons and collaborative work among students. The 2024 Korea Global Education Fair will run until June 2nd. Che Seung, Arirang News, Yosu. As many say, time is money, and Korean e-commerce businesses are betting on prompt deliveries to beat the competition from their Chinese counterparts. Our business correspondent Lee Soo Jin explains. It's an age where consumers need instant gratification in every part of their lives. And South Korean e-commerce companies are trying to provide this need to remain competitive. Q-commerce, or quick commerce, allows for deliveries to be made in just a couple of hours, and sometimes even less than an hour, thanks to local warehouses and stores in urban areas. This is one such local warehouse that's located in the capital city's Hall, one of the busiest and packed cities in the world, and its close proximity is what allows deliveries to be made quickly. And micro-fulfillment centers often serve as warehouses in crowded cities because they take up less space. The nation's first smart micro-fulfillment center in a gas station has not only maximized its use of space, but has also minimized labor costs thanks to its automated order fulfillment process. When goods arrive, an employee scans each item and places them in a basket that is automatically taken up to the second level. And that's where six robots sort and store up to 3,600 goods each day based on where and when they need to be delivered. 
We store and provide instant delivery of a variety of products such as makeup and phone accessories to nearby districts such as Gangnam-gu, Seocho-gu and Songpa-gu. This whole process, he says, takes only around five minutes, making instant deliveries possible. There are still other businesses that have joined the Q-commerce boom by taking advantage of their large network of stores, such as this health and beauty retailer that has around 1,400 chain stores across the nation. They offer a plethora of goods from snacks and supplements to makeup and perfume that can all be delivered within three hours of when the order is first placed. And it's been hugely successful as 60% of the online orders in the Seoul metropolitan area are Q-commerce deliveries. Korea has the best environment for Q-commerce because just by covering the Seoul metropolitan area, it can cover 70% of the demand as that area has 70% of the nation's purchasing power. He added that to further streamline delivery operations, businesses should use AI technology that can predict product demand to optimize inventories at local warehouses and stores. Lee Soo-jin, Arirang News. Let's take a look at the latest news in the world now. First to New York, where former U.S. President Donald Trump has been convicted on all 34 counts of falsifying business records in his criminal hush money trial. The verdict marks the first time a former or serving U.S. president has been convicted of a crime. Donald Trump protested the verdict, saying it was, quote, a rigged trial by a conflicted judge who was corrupt. Meanwhile, Justice Juan Merchant thanked the jurors for their service, saying, nobody can make you do anything you don't want to do. The choice is yours. After two days of deliberations, the 12-member jury announced its unanimous decision, finding Trump guilty on all 34 counts he faced. Unanimity was required for any verdict to be made. Justice Merchant said Trump's sentencing for July 11th, a few days before the start of the Republican National Convention. 77-year-old Trump will not be jailed ahead of the sentencing, where he faces a maximum sentence of four years in prison. In the U.S., incarceration would not prohibit him from campaigning or taking the presidential office. In Hong Kong, 14 pro-democracy activists were found guilty in a landmark subversion trial on Thursday, marking the largest use so far of a Beijing-imposed national security law. The 14 activists, including former lawmakers Lam Chuk Ting, Lung Kwa Kang and Helena Wong, ex-journalist turned campaigner Gwyneth Ho and ordinary Hong Kong residents who joined the mass protests of 2019, were convicted of a conspiracy to commit subversion they could face up to life in prison in later sentencing. Meanwhile, two defendants, barrister Lawrence Lau and social worker Li yue Shun, were acquitted. Those on trial were among the 47 activists arrested three years ago on charges of allegedly trying to overthrow the government by organizing an unofficial primary in 2020. The court ruled that this primary would have created a constitutional crisis for Hong Kong. To South Africa now and Thursday's parliamentary elections, where polls show the country's ruling party, the African National Congress, may lose its majority for the first time since coming to power 30 years ago. So far, ballots from around 43% of the voting districts have been counted with the ANC at 43%, followed by the Democratic Alliance at 24%. The ANC won 57% of the votes in the 2019 elections, but many blame the party for high levels of unemployment, crime and corruption in the country. Under South Africa's parliamentary system, if a party fails to achieve more than 50% of the votes, political parties must form coalitions. Nearly 28 million out of the 62 million South Africans registered to vote in this general election, with results expected over the weekend. Kim Xiong, Arirang News.
Good afternoon. The last day of May wraps the month up under sunshine and warmer temperatures. Afternoon highs should go up a couple of degrees higher this afternoon, and those in Gyeongsangdo provinces especially need to brace for high heat that could hover around 30 degrees Celsius this afternoon. And as the sunshine returns, there will be very strong UV rays beaming down on us nationwide. Taegwen Gyeongju see a high of 29 degrees, Seoul topping out at 26 degrees Celsius. Then there is rain in the forecast tomorrow for central regions and Gyeongsangbuk-do province. And that rain could start as early as tomorrow at dawn in Gyeongsangbuk-do, dropping on and off rain. But the rest of the country will start off under cloudy skies before turning sunnier in the afternoon. Rain could continue in eastern regions through Sunday, but most places will have a warm and sunny weekend. Then the first work week of June starts off with summer weather. With that in mind, let's take a look at the international weather conditions. And those are the headlines at this hour here in Korea. Coming up next is our daily panel session. And today we speak with an endearing senior fan of K-dramas and music. Do stay with us.